The Bell Aracuda could best be described as an expensive mix of innovations and oddities. During the mid-1930s, the idea of the heavy fighter was taking hold. Bomber technology was advancing at a terrific pace, and although many subscribed to the idea that the bomber would always get through, many also thought that fighter protection would remain a necessity. As a result of this, heavy fighters would be contemplated by many nations, as both bomber escorts and bomber hunters. In 1936, this very concept was being considered in the United States. Development of the Boeing B-17 was underway, and an operational requirement was issued for a long-range escort fighter. Two manufacturers would submit designs for this requirement, Lockheed and Bell. The Bell Aircraft Corporation was a new player on the highly competitive field that was the American aircraft industry, and the company needed to make a name for itself. The two competing manufacturers were awarded preliminary design contracts, and both submitted their proposals to the Army Air Corps by the deadline of March 15th, 1936. Bell's proposal was the XFM-1, which would become known as the Aerocuda. At a casual glance, it resembled a medium bomber more than a heavy fighter, and many people in fact referred to it simply as a bomber hunter rather than a fighter at all. It had an all-metal structure that was built around a pair of supercharged Allison V-1710 engines, and a powerful offensive armament. The wings were of box spar cantilever construction and comprised of central and outer sections. The front and rear of the fuselage were joined at the front spar of the wing for added stability, and the rear section was of a semi-monocoque construction. The V-12 liquid-cooled Allison engines put out 1,090 horsepower each, and they drove a pair of three-blade pusher propellers. They were arranged in such a way that the forward section of each engine nacelle could be dedicated as a gunner's compartment, albeit a fairly noisy one. Speaking of gunners, the proposed armament, by 1930s standards, was, well, impressive. It was to be equipped with a pair of forward-firing 30 caliber machine guns, which was fair enough, but it was also equipped with a pair of 37mm automatic cannons. These would be mounted in a pair of flexible cones that were on the front of each engine nacelle. Each of these would house a gunner, however their primary purpose was to feed the guns rather than fire them, though they could still do that in an emergency. The aircraft featured an innovative fire control system developed by Sperry Instruments, which would allow the navigator to operate the cannons remotely, with the gunners making minor corrections to their aim. In essence, what Bell had designed was a flying anti-aircraft battery that could engage enemy bombers beyond the range of their own defensive guns. In a pinch, it could also be used as a sort of fighter bomber, and could carry up to 20 30-pound bombs in bays installed in the wings, but this was considered more as an afterthought. It had a relatively meek defensive armament, which came in the form of two 50 caliber machine guns that were mounted in side blisters on the rear part of the fuselage. The Aerocuda had a crew of five. A pilot, a co-pilot and navigator, a radio operated gunner, and two dedicated gunners. The aircraft was designed to provide excellent frontal visibility. A plexiglass enclosed cabin extended from the nose all the way aft of the navigator's station, and the engine nacelles offered good visibility for the gunners as well. There was, however, a notable set of blind spots in the early design. The aircraft lacked any dorsal viewing ports or defensive armament, and the direct rear visibility was almost non-existent. Though this would be somewhat rectified later on, for now it remained an otherwise completely ignored design flaw. After a wooden mock-up had been built, and basic wind tunnel testing had been completed, construction of the prototype began in May of 1936. Work was completed by the end of summer in 1937, and on the 1st of September it would take off for the first time. When completed, the XFM-1 had a wingspan of 69 feet 10 inches, a length of 44 feet 10 inches, and a height of 13 feet 7 inches. This, combined with its mass, gave it both the looks and the feel of a medium bomber. It had an empty weight of 13,400 pounds, and a loaded weight of 17,333 pounds, not exactly a featherweight. Its twin Allison engines gave it a top speed of 270 miles an hour, a cruising speed of 244 miles an hour, and a normal operating range of 800 miles. Unfortunately, things would immediately begin to go wrong. During takeoff, the port engine backfired and blew in the air ducts as well as the intercooler. 
Another incident occurred during the second flight, this time during landing, when the starboard undercarriage refused to lock and thus collapsed upon impact. The aircraft was subsequently repaired, and after 10 more test flights where it proved that it could take off and land without trying to kill the test pilot, it was accepted at Wright Field for further testing on the 21st of October. It then went to Langley Field for further testing in 1938, where it made itself increasingly unpopular with the ground crews responsible for keeping it in a flying condition. What had looked good on paper was quickly becoming a nightmare in practice, and the Aerocuda became plagued with all sorts of maintenance problems. The engines, for example, were usually considered reliable and easy to maintain. However, when installed in the pusher configuration aboard the Aerocuda, they had insufficient cooling systems that failed to counter the lack of prop wash that helped cool the engines otherwise. As such, they overheated incredibly easily, to the point that the aircraft could not taxi on its own, and had to be towed from the hangar to the runway if it was any kind of distance. The armament, though powerful, proved to be both lacklustre and dangerous. The 37mm cannons had a low muzzle velocity, proved difficult to aim, and had the unfortunate tendency of filling the engine nacelle holding the gunner with smoke. This all reduced the effective range of the Aerocuda's guns, meaning that if it were to successfully hunt and shoot at enemy bombers, it would probably be doing so within the range of their defensive guns. Which leads on to the next problem, it was about as manoeuvrable as a brick. The Aerocuda suffered severe flight limitations. It couldn't make inwoman turns, fly inverted, or even complete basic rolls. It also took extreme offence to any sort of pitch input when under power, with even the slightest movements requiring immediate correction lest the aircraft continue moving in the original input direction. Perhaps the worst of its flaws was the electrical system. It featured an independent auxiliary power unit. This powered the aircraft's electrical systems as well as both the fuel pumps and the engines. Yeah, I can think you can see where I'm going with this. If said power unit were to fail, and fail it did, then the unlucky pilot would have no fuel pressure, and thus no engines, and also no hydraulic pressure for the gears or for the flaps. This happened on more than one occasion, and Ben Kelsey, who did many of the first test flights, was very lucky that he could either land the plane safely, or his crew could restart the APU before the plane lost total control. Despite repeated attempts at killing the pilots, hotboxing the gunners, and driving the ground crew to tears, the XFM-1 was put on display alongside several other Air Corps prototypes, including the Bell XP-39 at the Bowling Field Exhibition in January of 1940. During this time, a new version of the aircraft was being built. Back in 1938, not long after the first prototype was completed, the War Department had given a contract for 13 more aircraft for service testing. Nine of these would be completed as the YFM-1. These were powered by improved versions of the Allison engines that produced around 1150 horsepower, and many changes were made to address the long list of deficiencies with the first prototype. The engines were now housed in modified cowlings, and the air intakes were moved into the wing leading edge in an attempt to address the overheating issue. The engine superchargers were now built into the nacelles themselves, and propeller spinners were also added. The issue of defensive blind spots was finally revisited. The fuselage was lengthened and redesigned, with a periscope being fitted under the nose to detect threats from the underside. Along with this, the side blisters were replaced with hatches, and the machine guns were repositioned in ventral and dorsal hatches near the wing trailing edge to provide a better overall field of fire. The first YFM-1 made its maiden flight on the 28th of September 1939. Three of the delivered aircraft would be completed as the YFM-1A, which had a nose wheel undercarriage added to improve its takeoff and landing characteristics. Unfortunately, this rather backfired as they quickly developed a horrific nose wheel wobble. This was only solved after numerous tests involving a car fitted with the Aerocuda's nose wheel as a sort of Frankenstein testing unit. Despite the litany of problems, only two aircraft would be lost in accidents, with only one fatality being recorded from the second. That being said, losing two aircraft from a batch of just 12 still doesn't represent a glowing safety record, and the 13th was never completed. Further development of the Aerocuda was discontinued for various reasons. It was slow, it was unreliable, and it was becoming increasingly expensive. 
The remaining aircraft served operationally in a squadron for a period of time, but this was short-lived. In January of 1942, the nine remaining airworthy planes were dispersed to various training schools throughout the country. Some would be used by mechanics as instructional airframes, and some would be flown by pilots who wanted another odd plane to add to their logbooks. The failure of the Aerocuda could have been a serious disaster for Bell had their other design, the P-39 Aerocobra, not succeeded. Eventually, all of the Aerocudas were scrapped, and no examples of this strange aircraft survive to this day. As far as first aircraft go, Bell certainly chose to go with different rather than safe. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed today's video, thank you all so much for watching, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.